Morning, church. Thank you again for allowing me to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, If you would, turn in your copy of God's Word to the New Testament book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. Uh, Verses 1 through 10 will be my text, Uh, will be the text. My name is uh, Chris Merritt, and I have the privilege of serving as the executive pastor at Tabernacle Baptist Church in Decatur, and one of the great things that our church body has allowed me to do uh, is to be able to come and serve other churches occasionally. I have a limited amount of time. I'm allowed to do that a year. They keep uh, me in line, so that way I just don't go preaching at churches every week, Uh, but they give me the privilege to be able to come. Uh, and share the Word of God with churches just like yours. And I thank you uh, and your pastor for allowing me to do that several times and again this morning, and I'm excited to share with you uh, what God has put on my heart. And more importantly, as I've shared with most of you at some point in town, I am a mounder. Uh, I am from Blue Mound. Uh, You will find me on Friday nights uh, taking care of the chains at Meridian High School, and you guys still have not kicked me out, uh, probably because you guys win every single one of those games. Um, So uh, there was actually going to be a football player from our team who's kind of grown our uh, been grafted into our youth group recently who was supposed to be here, but I can make all sorts of jokes because he didn't show up. So (laughs) this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, it's a message that I've titled, uh, Experiencing the Fullness of God's Greatness. Um, I believe truly that we live in a day and age where things are busy sometimes, things are difficult sometimes, uh, and it's hard for us to experience how good of a, of a God it is that we truly serve. And I believe that in this text, Paul lines that out for us in an amazing way, which I hope will just uh, send you home in a way this morning that is falling more in love with Jesus this morning. Experience the fullness of God's greatness, living a life experiencing the fullness of God's greatness, which is a mouthful. So if I get that right through the entire sermon, I will probably buy myself crackles tomorrow as a reward to myself. All right, the text reads, Uh, These are the words of Paul to the church at Ephesus. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is two of the most beautiful words in Scripture. Verse 4 But God, being rich in his mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, You have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this church body, their ministry in this community. God, I thank you for uh, the privilege it is to come and share with them your word, uh, to be able to open it and say, this is a reminder of how good our God truly is. God, speak to our hearts. God, speak to my heart this morning when we have questions, when we have doubts, uh, when we have just busyness and trials. God, remind us of the amazing grace that we see through Jesus Christ. God, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, he is regarded as a genius, one of the top 10 artists in the history of the world. Little children in elementary school learn of him, learn of his artwork, and if they're anything like me, whenever I learned about him in elementary school, they learn of their temp- his temperament, which caused him, uh, after an argument with another painter he was working alongside, to take a razor and oddly cut off his left ear. His genius was in front of the entire world. He worked very diligently to make sure that his artwork was displayed in some of the most prominent places, publicly, high profilely displayed, work that today is regarded as some of the most famous ever created. And nobody noticed. Famously, there is only one record 
uh, of his hundreds of paintings selling, and it sold for such a low price that it even, didn't even cover the cost of his paint during the life of Vincent Van Gogh. Greatness was there for everyone to see, and as a world, collectively, we miss it. And we can hear phrases like, don't take this moment, don't take this person for granted. This is a one-time, uh, life, lifetime greatness being displayed right in front of us. Make sure that we observe it. Make sure that we take it in. Often we connect those statements to remarkable athletes or teams that dominate an era or maybe a moment in history that is happening before our own eyes that we want to take a picture of so that way we remember it and can share it with our children and our grandchildren. For parents, uh, Levi, I love the fact that you have a child today, and it reminded me this morning, uh, I now have a 16 and an 18-year-old, and as parents, uh, we wonder at one point in time, and you will too, where all the years went. Um, it, we remember, and we start to think, how is this child, which I one day just held in my hand or in my arm, how they are now out navigating the world on their own? And we, we, we remember back to the honor and the privilege of the time that we had to be mom, that we had to be dad. Why can we miss greatness? Truly, church, I, I don't know that answer. I, I'm sure it may be different for each and every one of us, the pressures of a busy world. Uh, misunderstanding, uh, especially of a personality, which is where I think uh, Van Gogh was. Uh, just priorities in life, other than what allows us to capture the greatness among us. Why we miss greatness for all of us probably has all sorts of different reasons, but I guarantee that there's one thing that as a Christian that we have in common. We have a God in heaven that is greater than anything that this life ever has to offer. And we don't have to wait till we are on the other side of eternity until we're in heaven to be with him experiencing the greatness of our God. But because we're all human, all those same reasons that we can miss greatness in the world playing out in front of us, we can also fail to miss and fail to live a life that expresses, that experiences the fullness of God's greatness. Throughout this room, there may be those who haven't given their life to Jesus Christ quite yet. There may be those who have been walking hand in hand with him for 60 plus years. This morning, no matter where you're at on that range, I want to encourage us, let's not miss a moment of our lives, experiencing the greatness of our God. In order to do that, there's three things that this text teaches us. The, the first thing that I want to share with you in order to live a life experienced in the fullness of God's greatness is we must first know our sin position, the reality of our sin position, which Paul lays out in kind of a depressing but a very clear way for us in verses one through three. Now, our nature is for us in humanity is to think, to try to think positively about ourselves. Nobody wants to think I'm a terrible person. No one wants to say that I've just done things that are completely wrong all the time. That's not where we want to have our mind, and when we get there, we want to get out of that headspace, and, and for good reasons. Uh, and we have this awareness that inside of our lives, there are things that we do that are wrong. Like some, we may just kind of have a tendency to be a little abrupt. Sometimes we're just a little bit rude. Uh, for some times we're impatient. And those things which may not even be sin, we know that we have those temperaments about us. Uh, but also, we know in the heart of our hearts as Christians that we also have a tendency to do things which are clearly wrong and the Bible calls sin. But what we want to do in order to justify that I'm truly a good person is we'll say, okay, I have these things that I do which I know that are wrong or I'm tempted to do which I know that are wrong, but if you compare them to my heart, I, I don't want to do those things. When you compare them to the things that I know I do that are loving and caring for other people, when you compare them to my intentions, we can come very easily to the result that whenever we look at the totality of our life, I truly am a good person. And that may be 100% true when we compare ourselves to the world standards. But we can't compare ourselves to the world standards. We may look at the world standards and say, I am a, a good person, I have goodness, but we have to compare ourselves to God's standards. And we will be judged by God's standards of holiness. Not only are we far off the mark 
of God's standard of holiness. Those times that we think, I did something good, I did something positive, I did something caring, uh, I did or wish I would have done something in this amazing way, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4 tells us very clearly that those in, a, in the love of God, he looks down upon us and sees those as filthy rags. If we truly want to live a life seeing the fullness of God's greatness, we have to deal with a very uncomfortable, difficult, sometimes depressing reality of our position in sin. And Paul jumps right into it in verse 1 and just kind of really starts ripping us, and he says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. The Bible teaches us that we're guilty of sin on two different accounts. First of all, we're guilty of Adam's sin. Thanks a lot, Adam. Uh, But because of Adam's sin, we have inherited a sin nature inside of us. Kids who are in the room today, you probably have characteristics of your parents. You may have your mom or dad's hair color, their eye color. Maybe you're going to grow up and be similar to their height. They give you these genetic things, but this one thing they're also going to give to you, but their parents gave it to them, and their parents gave it to them, and it's all started all the way with Adam, is we are all born with a sin nature. Even from the moment of our conception, we needed a Savior. And then number two, we also are doubly guilty of sin because of our sin in our lives, which we'll dive into a little bit deeper here in a second. And the result of being doubly guilty of sin, we see also in verse one, is we are dead. Of course, this means spiritually dead, not physically dead. We can do nothing in our spiritual nature to please God. Just as a person who is physically dead can't do anything to help themselves, can't do anything to bring themselves back to life, people, we being spiritually dead, we can do nothing to help ourselves. We are spiritually dead. We are done. We are finished. Finito. Period. Done. We're spiritually dead. And as uncomfortable as it can be dealing with, the reality, dealing with that reality is, and in order to see a life where we see the fullness of God's greatness, we also have to deal with the reality of how we got to this position of being spiritually dead, which Paul, in the encouragement of this text, after he tells us that we are spiritually dead, he also tells us that we're the ones who chose this. Now, whenever we talk about the fact that we are guilty of sin because of Adam, because of uh, we were born in a fallen body. I, I can get that. If you came up to me and said, you know what, that's just not fair. I could probably get on board with that. The fact that we need a savior from the moment of conception, that doesn't seem right, that doesn't seem fair, but I think Paul kind of also thought that we might think that, which is why he continues on in verse two and three whenever he says, in which you once walked following the prince of the power of air, speaking of these sins, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Not only did we inherit a fallen body, we all chose sin to follow Satan ourselves. Now, I mentioned that I have uh, now a 16 and an 18-year-old son. Um, I, they were not big for cartoons. They wanted to go outside and play in dirt and beat stuff up and tear things apart. Uh, so I probably haven't watched a cartoon in like 10 to 12 years. That's just not the nature. They're older, and even when they were younger, they had no interest in that. They would like to eat dirt and play in puddles. It's, it's what they did. But I remember very vividly uh, when you would see cartoons, and this may even be a little bit from my childhood, there would be these, these episodes where a, the, the character in the story, and it wasn't always a cartoon, sometimes they were in real life and they just added animated cartoons, would be needing to make a decision. And, and they'd need to choose between something which was a good and more moral decision and which was a unmoral, immoral decision. And they're thinking, sometimes they would play out what they're thinking in their head, and then all of a sudden, boom, on their right shoulder, there'd be this angel that comes and talks. And this angel would just speak to them and tell them all the reasons that they should make the good, the right, the, the honorable decision. Not necessarily godly decision. It's TV. This isn't a, it wasn't a religious show. But all these good and moral decisions. And as soon as that angel was done talking, you just all of a sudden, poof, there's this other thing over their left shoulder. And that's a little devil. And it starts telling them all the reasons that they should go ahead and be just a little bad and make these little choices. And the indication that we have in that moment that that character is listening to the angel on one side, to the devil on one side, is that before they make that decision, ultimately they are neutral. 
And sometimes we like to see ourselves as neutral. The truth is, there's absolutely no neutral with God. We can't be Switzerland. We can't pick neither side. Spiritually dead means that we have absolutely already chosen. And that our choice, we see in verse 2, is following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in the work of the sons of obedience. In our sin, we chose to follow Satan. Satan is not everywhere in this world like God is. He's not omnipresent. But he chooses to influence and allow us to follow him through spiritual warfare in the world system. In this world, for now on this side of eternity, belongs to Satan. And that's why we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Jesus tells us in his own words, in John chapter 12, verse 31, the ruler of this world, Satan, will one day be cast out. Now, we do have to be extremely careful whenever we look at texts like this because we can be tempted and many people have done things wrong like this and said, well, we can't enjoy things of this world because things of this world can lead us to be, have sinful things. Can I just share with you, God created this world and it's beautiful and he loves it and he created it for our enjoyment. We do have to be cautious that the world doesn't lead us to things which the Bible teaches us are clearly sinful. What this text teaches us is that we must be cautious of that. Satan is working today, and we see that in verse 3, how how we once followed him, who we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. When we think to ourselves, I really truly am, when you take the totality of everything together, am a good person, when we read in verse 3, when it says, whom we all, if you do a study of Greek of the word all, it means all, every single one of us. Oh, to live a life seeing the fullness of God's greatness. We have to be real about our position in sin. We turned from God. We chose sin. Our sin separated us from a holy God. Our sin drove the nails into the hands and the feet of a perfect Jesus. Our sin brought death and corruption into this world. In our sinful nature, there is no good. There is no neutral. There is only my rebellion. And if that isn't enough, Paul is just very encouraging in these first three verses. He's not done. In our sin position, which causes spiritual death, we got here by our own actions, our own choices, and Paul tells us what our future is. In verse 3, he tells us, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. As you look at that, like the rest of mankind, uh, in the language that it was written in, it really means like the unsaved. Uh, And John chapter 3 verse 18 tells us the future of those who are children of this wrath, whoever does not believe in him is condemned all ready. And at the end of this life, the reality for those who are condemned already because of our sin position, the fact that we are spiritually dead and we chose the position that we are in is that we will be eternally separated from God, spending eternity in hell. For the unsaved person, for the Christian I think what would scare us most is the fact that we would be eternally separated from a great and loving God. For the unsaved person, hell is probably the more scary thing. But in order to live a life seeing the fullness of how great our God is, and this isn't always easy in church because we want to look good, we want to look strong, we want to look like we're following God, but we have to deal with the realness of what our sin position is outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. The second thing I want to share with you this morning is in order to live a life experience of the fullness of God's great, greatness, we must know the radical nature of God's grace. Paul really spends verses one through three, three verses, telling us information that should want to take us, make us take ourselves out back and really just kind of beat ourselves up. It's the reality of it. I don't like reading this text. I love to get past the first point so I can get to the second point whenever we look at Ephesians chapter two, eternity and hell. My actions earned it. No goodness in me, spiritually dead, because I'm spiritually dead, there's nothing I can do about it. But then, these two life-breathing words, but God. 
We may not be able to do a thing about it, but there is a God who can. And in order to live a life seeing the fullness of God's greatness, we not only have to remember that not only can he, can he do something about it, but he truly did something about it. Verse four, but God being rich in his mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. But you notice in verse five, Paul, who's encouraging us, says in verse five, even though you are dead in your trespasses, wants to kick us in the shin again. We have a God that is so merciful and good, not because we did something to somehow uh, maneuver ourselves out of this, like Henry Houdini getting himself out of some trap, because God's love for you did something about it. And not because of anything of our goodness, not at all, even though we rejected him because of his great love for us. God created a way to rescue us from ourselves. Paul didn't tell the Ephesian church, um, if you're you're not familiar with the, the book of Ephesians, Paul had spent about three years with the church of Ephesus before he wrote this letter to the Ephesian church. So he assumed that, that they would have known how God saved us from himself. But I, I want to share that with you this morning. How does God rescue us from spiritual death? He sent his only son, the second part of the Trinity, down to earth. We think that we have to humble ourselves whenever we deal with the reality of our sin position. The one in which through creation was made, the one through which creation is maintained, humbled himself to come down to an earth which we broke and be born about as humble of a birth as possible. Place place in a feeding trough. Grew up poor, simple, nothing deserving of a king. Having all the temptations that we have, but living without sin. And at the right time, uh, provided us an example of baptism, being baptized uh, by John the Baptist, which ushered in three years of his recorded ministry for us, ministry that had some extremely high highs and had some really low lows, fulfilling all the prophecies of the Old Testament about the promised Messiah that would come to save us. And then finally, at the right, the right time, one of the lowest of lows that could have been experienced. He was betrayed by one of those that was closest to him so that out of the great love in which he loved us, the fullness of the righteous wrath of God was placed on him instead of being placed on us. And God's wrath was satisfied. But our God isn't like other gods. Other gods, they die and they just stay buried and they stay dead. On the third day, Jesus, he just got up and walked out of that grave. Paul left that part out of what Jesus did because he knew that the Ephesian church knew it. We have to share it so that way we can celebrate it. And then Paul jumps back in in verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. By putting our faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we join Jesus in his resurrection being brought back from spiritual death to spiritual life. Although although that we will face a physical death because of God's great love for us, we exchange eternity being separated from God, tormented in hell for eternity, worshiping him and his presence in heaven. How amazing is what our God did for us. We can't miss a moment of our lives not experiencing the fullness of God's greatness. He has provided everything that we need to be saved from our spiritual position out of his great love in which he loved us. Paul finishes (coughs) highlighting the radical nature of God's grace by sharing with us how we receive it. And it is extremely complicated and it's also extremely simple. Verse eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, a result of works, so that no one may boast. How do we receive it? Faith. Faith that we were actually in this sin position, but God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die, not just for the world, but for you, to forgive me for my sins because of his great love for us. This morning, when is the last time that we remembered and felt in the depths of our soul how radical 
God's grace is to save us from our sin position. I think we can be broken by the times. I mean, if you've been in church for a long time, I didn't grow up in church, but I've been there long enough now, that we, we walk through this church life and we hear what I shared with you, which Paul didn't share with the Ephesian church, just step by step what Jesus did out of his radical love for us to take the wrath of our sin upon the, cry, the cross. And it kind of becomes normal. We're used to hearing it, and we don't feel that in the depths of our soul. What Jesus did for us is never normal. It's never not radical. It's never not life transforming and I can feel in those moments where I look back on it and I just okay yeah Jesus died for me I died for my wife let's let's move on man how wrong that is God loved us in a radical way that nobody else will ever be able to love us the miracle of salvation should have that radical feel for us I want to share with you just a few texts of a song Uh, we sing it regularly in our church we sing it regularly in our youth group I'm not allowed uh, we have a choir, uh, probably about 75 people in our choir at our church. Um, Everybody is allowed in the choir except for one, and that's me. Uh, and you know, the crazy thing is, like, we've had multiple uh, worship leaders during that time, and they both tell me the same thing. Hey, you're so loud, lousy at, at singing, you're so lousy musically, and I love to worship, and I can't do anything musically at all. Uh, but our choir is for everyone except for you. Uh, So I will not sing it to you this morning, but I will share it with you. You've probably heard this, maybe here, maybe on the radio. Uh, It's it's a song called King of Kings. And in the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. The beauty of this is this this song is is scripture saturated. Till the stone was moved for good, for the lamb had conquered, conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. If you know the song, don't stop singing it in your hair, in your head. The angels stood in awe. What does that mean? Where does that come from? The angels stood in awe of salvation. We, we actually find this truth in First Peter. He tells us, speaking of the radicalness of salvation, before God revealed to the angelic beings what would happen with salvation, they had no idea how was God going to save us from ourselves. And when they actually saw and knew what God through Jesus would do for us, even the angels were sitting at the edge of their seat, were in awe of this beautiful thing called salvation. (coughs) In order to live a life experiencing the fullness of God's greatness, we have to remember and be in awe of the radical nature of what he did for us out of his great love. Third and finally, in the order, in order to live a life experiencing the fullness of God's greatness, we must finally know the role God allows for us. We see this in verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. God isn't done once somebody is saved. In fact, that's the beginning. He has a purpose and a plan, not just for that purpose, person. God has a purpose and a plan for eternity, for situations, and he allows us the opportunity to be a part of it. As his workmanship, he molded us uniquely in our mother's womb to be part of his plan and to take the hope of the radical love that God has through us, for us, through Jesus, of the gospel to the ends of the earth. In glory, every tribe, every nation, tongue, and people group will be there declaring the goodness of God. God could have chosen to spread this message through a loudspeaker that just plays radically over the earth. Instead, he chooses for our lives to be the loudspeaker, which shares about the goodness and the greatness of his radical love. This isn't a burden, it's a mission, and it's a purpose, something greater than anything that this world could ever offer us. There are so many great privileges to serving a life in a local body church. I can't limit them to three, but I want to share them with you. I've I've been at our church now for 15 years, and I share with them regularly when I get the chance to preach with them, uh, that outside of my family, they are the second best thing that has ever happened to me. Of course, God would be first. But these are the privileges that stand out over everything else. When you see God work in the heart of somebody and they come to saving grace in Jesus Christ, there's nothing that compares to that. Number two, 
and I get to work with our students. That's one of my primary responsibilities. Uh, so you get to see that a lot more. But whenever you see somebody truly start to fall in love with the Word of God, and through the Word of God, they start to know Him better, and they can't lay it down because they're so in love with this Jesus, which we find preserved for us in His Word, that is amazing to see God work in a person's life that way. Number three, and this ties to this text. This text. When someone in our church family sees, connects the purpose that God has for them with the way that he has designed them uniquely, and a door opens for them, and they're scared to death to walk through it. But out of faith, they take a little step, and then God opens another door and another door, and after a few of those steps, their eyes are open to, I have had these skills my entire life, and it seems like what God is opening up to me is the reason that God has given these my entire life. I just didn't know it. And they get a passion for ministry. They get a passion for serving. They get a passion for wanting to share his great and radical love in a way that they've never experienced it before, but gives them a purpose and a passion and an urgency in life that is incomparable to anything that this world has to offer. Calm down if you think that Pastor Chris asked me to come get you guys to serve in the church in a different way. That's not what I'm talking about whatsoever, and Pastor Chris has no idea what I'm sharing with you. What I'm saying is God has uniquely designed each and every one of us to be a part of taking his grace to the ends of the earth. And part of experiencing the fullness of his great love for us is realizing the way that he uniquely designed you and the purpose that he has for that in his eternity. Don't tell Pastor Chris I said this. Sometimes we have to stop doing things in the church, serving in the church, in order to be unleashed. And you may think, Chris, me, not Pastor Chris. God, there's nothing special about me. God hasn't given me any amazing gifts. I'm just like every other person. I, I'm, I'm trying to be a good person. We already discussed that. But I'm just like everybody else. Guys, I believe with the fullness of my heart that God doesn't equip the called. He calls, the, or God doesn't call those who he's equipped. He equips those who have called. he's called. Before he called me to ministry, I don't know if I've shared this with you before, I would probably be hiding in the back corner of that wall, not speaking with anybody because I am one of the most shy, incredibly like lonesome, pull myself together, pull, get away from everybody, people you have ever met. When God called me to gospel ministry, somehow all that went away. I, I would have never spoken in front of five people, let alone 500 people. God, when he calls you to something, equips you with that skill. It doesn't mean you're necessarily born with it, but man, whenever he unleashes you for the purpose that he has in your life, there is nothing like it, and there is nothing like seeing your brothers and sisters in Christ. Grab onto that and take on with that. God w will provide for his church in order to live a life seeing the fullness of God's greatness. We must know the role that God allows us to be a part of it and cling to that with eternal joy. At this point, I go ahead and ask the worship team to head back up if we get ready to close. In September of this last year, um, just a few months ago, a Van Gogh painting that had been stolen and nobody knew who had, who had stolen it and anonymous, anonymously was delivered to a detective to his home wrapped up in bubble wrap and an Ikea bag. Why not? If you're going to steal a painting that's worth millions of dollars, put it in an Ikea bag. That just totally makes sense. The detective, what, the rationale that ended up being uncovered was the, det the detective had gotten so close to solving the case of who had stolen this painting from the museum uh, that, that the thief who had stolen the painting decided, you know what, it would be better for me just to return the painting to the detective than it would be to ultimately be captured. The painting was valued at over $6 million. The greatness of the artist completely missed while he was living. Now just one sample of his greatness worth over six million dollars. Those millions, pocket change compared to living a life seeing the fullness of God's greatness. The question we have to deal with this morning is, are we missing it? Are our lives so busy? Do we have other priorities? Maybe, maybe we've just gotten off track of, of seeing how great and merciful and loving our God truly is, are we missing it? Do we check that box of salvation? 
years and years and years ago. So the depths of our depravity, uh, where God saved us from, we're good. We, we will experience heaven on the other side of this eternity. What I want to share with you this morning, if that's where you're at, is don't miss living this life experiencing the greatness of how good our God is. We don't have to wait till we're in heaven worshiping him. We can experience that today. Let's live a life seeing the fullness of his greatness. If you've never given your life to him, the the opportunity to do so is always now. You don't need a special moment. You don't need a special prayer. What you need is the reality of what he did for us out of his great love for us and the trust in him by faith. God, thank you this morning for the opportunity just to share your word with this church body. God, I pray that your spirit has worked in our lives. God, that even if one person is is taking a moment and pondering how great you truly are, what, what situation that we were truly in before we see the words in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, but God and has lifted them up in a way, then God, everything is worth it because you are honored. Much is made of you. God, give us a passion for you. Give us a passion to serve, not to see great things done through us, but to see great things done through us for you. God, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.